The first five consciousnesses, the eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, and the body, um, will st study all the eight consciousnesses according to certain topics. And we've been talking about uh, the perceived objects of the first five cons consciousnesses. And um, if we can just a very brief, very briefly on the review, uh, how our consciousnesses perceive the world. The first uh, perceived world is the state of real objects, the absolute reality as the way it is. And then the second one is the state of distorted objects. The third is the imaginary state of subject-object discriminations. Now, I would like to, to let you think about it. Of the three states, which one pertain, or the, five, the first five consciousnesses pertain or associated with which state, do you know? With, with the three, the first one is the state of real objects, the actual reality, the direct actual reality that your eyes, your ears, your nose, the tongue, your body perceive. The first state, the real objects. The second state is distorted objects. This total object is you look at the world with your own glasses, uh, with your own view, with your own judgment, your own evaluation, your own analysis. You stereotype it. So that's the second state. The, se the third state is you just imagine it. There's no such perceived object. You just ima imagine it in your dreams, in your hallucinations, in your imaginations. So these are the three perceived worlds of all your eight consciousnesses. Which one pertains to the, the first five? That's the first one. The actual direct reality. You look at an apple, that's the, you perceive an apple, but you haven't judged and evaluate that apple is sweet, sour, or whatever. That goes on to the next stage, which is your, which is your mono consciousness, your sixth consciousness, which evaluate and judge and stereotype and, and do all that kind of evaluation and reasoning. So the first five relates to the state of real objects. When we study Buddhism, the Yogacara approach of Buddhism, we always have to reflect back and ask yourself a question. If I know these, what would knowing this lead me to understand more? It leads you to understand more by saying that you haven't stereotyped it in the first thought. In your first thought, you just perceive it. But in your second thought, it's not the same anymore. In your second thought, you continue with the stereotyping. You can, you, the, the egoistic view will be brought out to judge on the first thought. What you need to do is don't let the second thought of, of stereotyping, of mental functions of jealousy, hatred, arrogance, depression, fear, anxiety, don't let that second thought come up. All these eight consciousnesses are related to these three states, nothing else. You need to know which one. Okay, now that we'll talk about that in the in, in the previous session. Now, we should take a look more at something new. We can just stay in the first, in the uh, perceived world, in the objects. Now, remember we have the subject and we have the object. And when our sensory organs perceive objects, we interact with objects, what arises is the consciousnesses. That arises. And this consciousnesses depend on the sensory organs. Without sensory organs, we don't have this consciousness arising. So that depends on the sensory organs. And the consciousnesses perceive the objects. And in the process of per perceiving the objects, 
how do the consciousnesses get to know, reason, and evaluate the perceived objects? So that's the second topic that we talk about. How do we evaluate? How do we know? So this is the second topic we have to know or do. The modes of knowledge, how you know, how you believe in something. If somebody asks you, oh, I must believe in things that I, I can scientifically prove. That's not what you believe. That's not how human beings believe. Not just scientifically proof is one way of believing. You're believing in a source, in a trustworthy source. You think a trustworthy source. But when you believe in something, not necessarily that you really have to see with your eyes, hear with your ears, taste with your tongue, and touch with the body. How do you believe in something? How do you know something? How do you get to know something? You need to know this in order to, to have the argument, in order to logically think about how you evaluate. So what's the first one? Direct veridical perception. A three times of knowing. The first five perceptual consciousnesses give a truthful picture of reality. You see an apple, you are hearing the river flows, that's what's happening here and now. So there's direct, immediate, truthful, verifiable, actual facts. So direct, veridical perception. How you perceive it immediately, without any tainted glasses that you, you judge. The direct. That's the truth, right? This is, what I see now is really what exists. That's the reality. Veridical perception. You can say, if I, if I see that PowerPoint, you can say, I don't see it. No. That's direct veridical perception. Verifiable. The second one is inference. It is an assumption based on perception. It is the process of deriving logical thinking of assumed premises or the process of arriving at some conclusions that possesses some degree of probability relative to premises. So we're talking about now of assumptions, probability, and logical thinking. That is what your consciousnesses think upon interaction of your first five consciousnesses which have sensed the objects. Uh, for example, you see an apple, and you say, oh, the way I, I evaluate that apple is a red apple, it's from California, or it's from whatever. That's, much, that's a sweet apple. But you haven't tasted yet. You just infer by your viewing it, smelling it, touching it, that it's a sweet apple. So that is inference. You believe something by inference. Not necessarily believing in something by touching it, seeing it, that kind of thing. It's, it's an inference. And, um, and then also, the way you know, the way you believe in, is fallacy, dreams and hallucinations. And then fourth, knowledge from saints and trustworthy source. These are the four ways of knowing. That's how you know something. That's how you believe in something. So next time, if somebody asks you, hey, Mr. A or, or oh, Janet, uh, Joan, why do you believe in Buddhism? Have you seen a Buddha yet? Have you seen a Buddha before? You haven't. Why do you believe in something you haven't seen? You must, he, he, would, he would say, I, I always believe in things I actually see it. If you don't see it, how can you believe in it? That's not wrong. That's wrong. That's not what you're doing. You believe in things in four ways, no other, no other ways. You believe in veridical perception, you believe it by influence, by think, logical thinking of, of assumed premises, by probability, that's how you think. And can it, is there any example about inference? Like you believe in something by inference. You see Mr. A, that's direct veridical perception Mr. A, and, and then you, the second thought is, oh, that's, that's Chan, I know him. There's already an assumption that is the true Mr. Chan that you know. And then 
and then you say, oh, this guy just looks tired. You already passed your, your, your evaluation on that guy. And this guy, hey, he's, it's, uh, you stereotype that guy. So you, you, the, the inference immediately arises on a second thought. Your first five consciousnesses only relate to this one, which I highlight for you, direct veridical perception. Your eyes cannot evaluate. Your eyes can only perceive. Your eyes can say, the eyes itself, the eyes per se can say, the eyes cannot say that's Mr. Chen. It goes back to your, your sixth consciousness, which gives that impression that's Mr. Chen. Or there's a short guy, a tall guy, a, a handsome guy, a, you know, there's an ugly guy, guy. I mean, that is inference already. You always pass that inference. That belongs to the, the mono consciousness, not the first five. That belongs to the sixth consciousness. Inference is a way of knowing. What's the results of this way of knowing? It's either true or not true. Sometimes your inference will lead you to the truth. Sometimes your inference will lead you to something that's untrue. When you stereotype someone, it's untrue. You think that guy, he looks, he looks like a criminal, therefore he must be a criminal. That's my inference. But actually, he's not a criminal, so your inference is wrong. Sometimes your inference could be right, sometimes your inference could be wrong. But this is factually right. That one is not. You always pass your judgment. And everybody is using this to judge. Everybody is using this to, to infer. That's the problem area. That's how you know something. You don't know that you already have seen the world with your own tainted eyeglasses. You are stereotyping. You're passing judgment. You're passing evaluations. And what is more, this kind of inference differs from person to person. Your, your inference is not the same as mine. The way you look at something is not the same as mine. Why? Your background is different from mine. Your intelligence is different from mine. Your education is different from mine. Your karmic energy is different from mine. Your previous karma that you brought forward to this life is different from mine. There's no same inference exactly. There's, not, there's no identical inference. But everybody's different. You could have distorted that picture more than I. So I can say that the way I look at something is the same as what you look at. Generally, it may be. Specifically, it's not the same. A general picture may be right. But when it comes to the general picture, it may refer to the first direct, direct veridical perception. If I say, that's a PowerPoint slide, then that would be a direct veridical perception that everybody would agree. Because there's no inference from it. But I say, this PowerPoint slide, it's, it's not clear. It's not of the best quality. Where did he get, where did he buy it from? And the PowerPoint is not put in, is not structured in a good way, I don't like it. There's already an inference. The inference, it belongs to the sixth consciousness, which is awareness of a self-imposed idea on certain things, okay? Fallacy, uh, so that inference may be right or wrong. Fallacy is dreams and hallucinations. It's your own knowledge, your dream. That's a fallacy. It's wrong, but you fall into that fallacy. For all this knowledge from saints and trustworthy source, you, the way you believe in something, you don't really need to see it actually, hear it actually, to believe it. Sometimes you know from trustworthy source. Say if you are in, uh, in, uh, in, in Hawaii, and your mom is in Vancouver, and you want to know, hey mom, what's the weather like in Vancouver now? And the mom said, oh, this is sunny. You believe it, because you know that your mom won't cheat you on such a question. 
So you believe, you believe your mom because you know your mom wouldn't, wouldn't tell you something untrue on that kind of, a, on that kind of an inquiry. And um, if you're in a high school teacher, the high school teacher, you see, tell you that, okay, according to the history books, this is how Rome was built. This, was in, this is the time that when Rome was built. And, uh, the, uh, the Roman philosophers are like this and like that. You believe in the teacher because you know the teacher won't cheat you because the teacher have books that you can verify. So knowing something, believing in something, not necessarily you have to see it with your own eyes, your own ears. You listen with your own ears. You taste it with your own tongue or you touch it with your own hands. You base on all these things to believe in something. No exceptions. But you understand that all these is already tainted, distorted, inference, fallacy, even knowledge sometimes is tainted. When, when you want to examine it closely, sometimes even the first one may not be true. If you have an eyes that give you illusions, when you see an apple, you told me it's not an apple, it's an orange. You have direct veridical perception of that one. You think it's an orange, I think it's an apple. Even that sometimes may not be true. If your first five senses are sick. So these are the four modes of knowledge that you try to know. And then I'm going to ask you another question. How does it help you in your enlightenment? How, how does knowing that help you in your enlightenment, in your meditation? The first perception enters your ears, your, your eyes and everything, all that is factual, but then you attach to it, you infer from it, that already gives you the wandering thoughts in your meditation. And you know that everything you see, you always pass your personal judgment, so that if you want to be objective, sometimes you will stand back as, am I right? Am I right doing this? What is the right way of doing this? Am I right to gamble all the time? Am I right to, to be involved with relationships all the time? And am I right to be attached to fame and reputation all the time? Am I right to be angry? That you, you start to, you start, start to ask this question where you know these are the modes of knowledge of how you understand something. All right, so. So the Yogacara is to help you to understand the world, to understand yourself, understand relationships, your relationship with the world. Whenever the eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, and the body see something, and also when it carry out as a result of seeing something, listening to something, they, they, are rich, they automatically pass a moral judgment onto it. Or it itself actually creates certain moral judgment. We call it the moral natures of it. None of the five perceptual consciousnesses contain the potential for making moral distinctions, so each one is per se indeterminate in nature. But it interacts with the six consciousnesses simultaneously and creates wholesome, unwholesome, or indeterminate deeds. So in other words, every consciousness of, of all the eight, every consciousness is, when has the moral nature, has three moral natures, wholesome, unwholesome and indeterminate. It would carry out, or by nature, in the process of making judgment and carrying out these actions, what all the actions, the speech, the thought, Every thought, every action, every speech, every, as a result of the creation of this consciousness, would have three natures, good, bad, or indeterminate. That, that embraces everything. And all these nature creates karma. 
So that's the reason why when your thought comes up, there arises a thought, an unwholesome thought, a sensuous thought, or a thought of greediness, a thought of depression, a thought of jealousy, a thought of hatred, a thought of, um, you name it, arrogance. You think the thought comes up and that's it? It would reinforce your seats in the lie consciousness. So if you're always jealous, you think that thought comes up, oh, I don't want to jealous anymore. Yes, but when it comes up, you already have increased your energy of jealousy in your lie consciousness. So if you continuously to have that thought of jealousy, it would increase your jealousy. If you continuously have that thought of hatred, it would increase your hatred of your depression, of your anxiety. That thought will accumulate the momentum until it gets stronger and stronger. So it's very important that you have to discard, have to let go of that thought. Let it go, otherwise it will increase the momentum. It would, it would continue to, to water the seeds, the unwholesome seeds, unwholesome seeds, indeterminate seeds, in the, your store of, con, of, of energy seeds in you. So you have to watch out your thought. That's the reason why every thought counts. But most people don't watch out their thoughts. They just let their thoughts run wild. Who can control their thoughts? Nobody can. When it comes up, that thought will lead you to the action. And once the action is performed, you feel regretful. Oh, I have lied. I have committed sexual misconduct. I have killed. I have harmed others. I have yelled. I've got angry. I've got, I have got all these things that I have thought about. You think, you only, you only feel regretful after the thought comes up, not before. But you already have created the karma. Some karmic energy is hidden. We call seeds, like a seed, plant seeds. But it's not actually seed, it's just a hidden karma. We, we, we compared it to a seed of a plant. And some is already carried out as action. So it creates karma. So we, now, right now we are studying the moral natures of consciousness. And we know that it has three natures. Wholesome, unwholesome, and determined, indeterminate. And I would like to ask, or trigger a thought in you, the first five consciousnesses pertain or associated with which moral nature? With wholesome one? Your eyes itself? No, it's not guilty. Your eyes look at some pornography. Your eyes are not guilty. Only your sixth consciousness is guilty. Your eyes only see. So your eyes, your ears, your nose, your tongue, your body per se by itself only is neutral. Nothing to do with wholesome and unwholesome. It's your sixth consciousness that creates whether it's a wholesome thought and wholesome thought. But then, even indeterminate nature creates karma. Now, a wholesome thought, action, speech, will lead to wholesome effects. Unwholesome will lead to unwholesome effect. But how, how about indeterminate? Indeterminate will create ignorance effect. Because you should have spent your indeterminate time to be enlightened. You should not spend indeterminate time like somebody would say, well, I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm watching a television. I'm not having a thought, a bad thought. I'm just, watch, I'm just sitting in here doing nothing. I'm not, I'm not germinating any unwholesome thought. I'm not germinating any wholesome thought. I'm neutral. I'm okay. I'm indeterminate. You're not okay because you're wasting your time. You're wasting your time in neutrality. You're wasting your time in indeterminate situation. You should spend your time in enlightenment. You're, you're wasting your time in laziness of just sitting there doing nothing. Okay, so that's creating karma. 
So if you spend your eyes, your ears, your nose, your tongue, your body, even though it is indeterminate, but if you are not spending it on wholesome and wholesome and in an indeterminate situation, you're also creating bad karma. You can't say, I'm, I'm creating no karma, no. There's no such thing as creating no karma. Every thought counts. Every thought of anxiety will increase or seats. Every thought of fear, arrogance, greediness, hatred. You think a thought comes up and that's it? It continues to reinforce the next thought. Talking about creating karma, maybe some beginners, you may not know what karma is all about. Let's rush very quickly of what karma. Karma is an action, a physical, verbal, Action, not just the, the, the action performed. It also includes a physical action, verbal action, and mental action. Mental action is thought. So host, unwholesome and wholesome. Unwholesome physical action, killing, stealing, and sexual misconduct. Verbal, lying, immoral language, slandering, and double tongue speech. Mental, engaging the mind in objects of attachment. Engaging in thoughts of harming others, engaging in wrong views. We have all done these every day, every moment. Every moment we have wrong, we have our obstinate self view. Every moment we're always thinking about us, ourselves. Every moment we attach in what we are habitually attached to. If you're attached to alcohol, then you say, okay, after this session is over, I'm going to go in the liquor store and get some alcohol to drink. Every thought, every thought, if you analyze every thought, you're related to all these, physically, mentally, and, 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 and verbally. Immoral language, slandering, double-tonguing, lying. Now, there are details of all these things, not just the, it's just a rough, generalization of the physical, verbal, and mental. But if you analyze in detail, every thought, we are involved with that. Directly or indirectly. Say, for example, killing. I didn't kill anybody. You say, I didn't kill anybody. I didn't kill a fly, a mosquito. A, a, I didn't kill anyone. But then after this session is over, you I don't want to eat in the temple, eating a hamburger I like. You're supporting killing. Killing of cows, killing of pigs, of chickens. You are support. You are indirectly supporting killing because you're not a vegetarian. You like to eat meat. You like to taste the flesh of animal, the flesh and blood of animal. So you are supporting killing, stealing, directly or indirectly. You know, if you analyze all these in detail, every one of your thought, every action, every speech, you're involved with it. A wholesome, what? Abstinence from killing, no killing, no stealing, no sexual misconduct, no lying, no immoral language, no slandering, no double tonguing, not engaging in objects of attachment, not engaging in thoughts of harming others, not engaging in wrong views. Now, this is, that is wholesome thought. Generally, for people who don't understand, you may think that I'm not creating any karma, I'm not doing anything wrong, I'm not doing anything bad, but actually every thought you're doing that. You may not realize it. Not just the action, not just of the speech. And then finally, what's karma? Karma means action. The nature of every action can be classified into wholesome, unwholesome, and indeterminate. Every action we do and every intent we think creates karma. Wholesome intent and deed contribute to wholesome karma and future happiness. Why are you encountering so much unhappy situations? Not because of God, not because of others imposing on you. You created your own unhappiness. While unwholesome intent and action contribute to unwholesome karma and future suffering, karma is closely associated with rebirth. You are involved with reincarnation. You are in samsara because of your karmic energy. Karma can, can be classified in three types, which I already mentioned, body, that, those of body, of speech, and mind. Karma can be divided into physical, mental, and verbal action. This is just to, to reveal what karma is all about. 
So you are creating karma every moment in your thought. And when you have created unwholesome karma, unwholesome deeds will come up and you can't get away with it. That we should know. We already know, right? Okay, then get, let's get to the next one. We already have known the, as far as the first five consciousnesses are concerned, we know the first topic is the perceived world, the objects. We already know how do we perceive the object, how do we assess, quantify, evaluate the object, the most of knowledge. And now, we already have touched on the moral nature of the consciousness. Now let's get into the next topic, the realms of activity of the first five consciousnesses. The realms, how are they active? How are they actively performing their functions? The three consciousnesses are active in the first and second realms of the universe. And what does that mean? In order to understand the realms of the activities of the first five consciousnesses, and how come the only three consciousnesses are active in the first and second realms of the universe, we have to understand the levels of the universe, the nine grounds, the nine realms of the universe. Because in some grounds, in some, in some worlds, they don't need nose consciousness. They don't need tongue consciousness. Only in this realm, we need them. And in a higher level, they don't even need eyes and, ear, and ears and body. We are living in a world that is lower, so we still need this kind of consciousnesses to exist. But in some existence, they are so superior that they don't need eyes and ears and nose and tongue to exist. They are living in a much higher level. We may think that we humans are the most intelligent, but we are not. Let's analyze this. The nine realms, and somebody call it the nine grounds, or the nine levels of existence. Some people think that we humans are the only existence. No. We are low existence. We're just better existence than the animals, uh, broadly speaking. Some of human existence are even not better than animals. If you're living in, a, in, in an underdeveloped country where humans are not treated as good as animals in, an, in the developed countries. So let's analyze the nine realms in order to understand the realm of activities of, of the first five consciousnesses. We were living in three worlds. The world of desire, or the realm of desire, the world of matter or of form, and the world of no matter, matterless realm. There's, there's no form, formless realm. So there are three levels of existence, and we are only in here, we're the lowest level. When we're talking about lowest level, what kind of generally, what kind of desires we have? Whether the, we have the sexual desire, desire for food, desire for wealth, Desire for reputation, desire for sex, desires for lots of insatiable desires in this world. So we call that this is the world of desire. That's the world that we, you, all of us live in. And, and there are higher realms, the higher worlds, higher hum, high existence, higher than us. But let's, in order to understand the, the, how this consciousness is actively uh, doing, we have to understand the nine realms. Let's take a look at the first realm. The first realm, we call it the first ground. We have nine grounds, right? Nine realms. The first realm, we have the six desire heavens and the reincarnations of humans, actually reincarnations of the heavens too, of humans, azuras, animals, ghosts, and hell victims. So one, two, three, four, five, six. We call it the six paths of reincarnation, the six reincarnations. Heavens, sometimes you call them the angels, heavenly beings. But this, there are six heaven levels in this realm. 
And there are also core heavens in this higher realm, but they're not core heaven anymore because heavens still have desires, gender desires. Humans, of course, were humans. Azuras, Azuras are in heavens, but they are a different existence. Azuras are always competitively fighting with existence, with, with the heavenly existence. Now, you should, if you don't understand what Azuras mean, you can, you can always take a look at, at Google or, or Google or some sources to find out. These are also heavenly, but they are not as, as uh, morally as high as to have heavenly beings. So humans, we are humans, animals, ghosts, and hell victims. So these are the six paths of reincarnations in the realm of desires. You and I, we are in that. And then there's a higher realm. That's the realm of matter. This is the realm of desire. There's a gender in here. Men and women. And here, there's no gender anymore. You don't need that. You don't need the sexual desire to exist. So sexual desire is a lower level of existence. So this is second ground, second dhyana, third dhyana, fourth and fifth dhyana. In here, there's no such thing as a woman and a man. And here, there's such thing as a, when a man loves a woman, when a woman loves a man. In here, no more desire. Higher level, at a much higher level of existence. We think that we are happy in here, but we are not. We go through suffering in here. First dhyana, second, third, and fourth. There's a lot of people call heavenly existence in here. But this heavenly existence has no, has no desire already. But they still have matter. In other words, the eyes, the ears, you still need them. You still need them to exist. And there's a high, much higher level than this. No more, no more matter now. This is molecules and substance and protons and electrons. This, this is, they still have substance in here. But here, you don't need the substance anymore. Substance, molecules, protons, electrons, give you burden. Your body cells give you burden. You think your body is, is a good thing? Your body gives you the burden. Only by discarding this body, then you get to a higher level. But you cannot. Your karmic energy pull you down to the next round of reincarnation where you have to get into a body. The body of an animal, the body of a ghost, the body of, of hell victims. You can't escape bodies. You can't escape form. You can't escape desire. Not to say form, of course you cannot. You cannot escape desire. But in here, existence in here, they already have discarded the burden of sex. They are in a much higher level. They are in a, in a level that's no more desire, but they still have matter. They still have to wear the coat of matter. But in this level, even matter don't exist. Infinite space, infinite consciousness, nothing whatsoever, neither cognition nor non-cognition. At a higher level, in, well, if we can say it in another way, only consciousness left. That's the higher level. They already have discarded desire, of course. They have already have dis discarded the burden of matter. They are in a non-matter situation, but they still have a self. They still have a consciousness. They still have consciousness of that self, and that's the problem. Once they have discarded even the consciousness, no more self, where would they go to? Neroda. In here is all suffering, still have suffering. And of course the happiness, the degree of happiness increases as it goes to a higher level. People here are extremely happy compared to, pe to, to existence in here. People here live, live for millions of years. Happiness increase as you go up higher and higher and higher. But you still haven't gone out 
from suffering and samsara. Only when you get out from this realm, you get into Niroda, cessation of suffering and samsara. That's what we call the Buddha, Niroda, a Nirvana. So you really have to know these so that you know where are you now? Where are we now? We're in this lower level. How can we get out? Very difficult. The Buddha already got out and told us what to do to get out. But we always feel happy and attached to what we are doing in here that we cannot get out. We always suffer. We suffer from life after life after life and we still don't know about it. The Buddha already got out from these. And there are many people, many existence who are higher than us, they already got out from desire. They already got out from matter. But they're still in here. Once they discard this, there's three burdens in here that you have to let go. Let go of desire, let go of matter, let go of no matter of consciousness, and then you get the neuroda. Where would the first five consciousnesses associated with. In other words, your eyes, your ears, your nose, your tongue, your body. We are studying the realm of activity of the first five consciousnesses, right? Your first five consciousnesses are active in which area? Your eyes, your ears, your nose, your tongue, your body are only active in a low state low level. What's the first level? Here. All five are active in here. All five senses. You need your eyes, your ears, your nose, your body, your tongue to live in here. Because you are low level. But once you get to the first dhyana, only eyes, ears, and body are active. Which two are not active? Can you tell me which two are not active? Huh? Huh? Nose and tongue. Nose and tongue are not active in the first dhyana because you don't need them anymore. Why? Why? Why, do you, why don't you need your nose and tongue anymore? You know why? What do we need the tongue and the nose for? Eating. In a higher level, you don't need the kind of food that you're eating now. You think your food is good? Your things stink. Your food stink when you get to a higher level. They don't need the kind of food that we need. What is food useful for? Nourishment of your body, right? That's what the, the purpose of the food, right? Nourish your body. And how many kinds of nourishment are there in the nine realms? There are four kinds of nourishment, four kinds of food, so to speak, in all the nine realms. The first was what? Mouthful food. Mouthful food. The breakfast, the lunch, the dinner, we have to do it muscles, mouth by mouth. Our tongue tastes it, our nose smells it. Mouthful. And the food substance is perceived through smell, taste, and contact. This ordinary food gives bodily nutrition. Then this kind of food would change. And this kind of food would get into your body. It would go through all the, the, you know, the circulations and all that. And then finally, it has to be discarded as what? Excretion. And this excretion stings. It's gross. It's, 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 it's something that, that this higher people, you know why this higher existence, even if they have the ability to come to this world, they don't like to. Because you stink, really. I stink. Because you have to excrete the kind of food that you ate. And then in some sutras, that says that they don't want this, um, the ETs in here, <laughs> if you know what I mean by ETs, they don't want to come to this world. 
This existence, they don't want to come. This, this, this world is like a prison. They don't want to come here. So the first kind of food is by nutrition that you need your nose and tongue. The second kind of food is by what? It's by mental contact. So in other words, this kind of food nourishes the body by contact with joyous situation. For example, in this level, every existence is in a high meditative state. And when they're meditation, when they're meditating, they still have a body, right? When they're meditating, their body is in a posture, all the eyes and ears in a posture that would produce joy, bliss to them. The six consciousness will enjoy this bliss to them. They don't need to eat. They don't need to eat the mouthful food that we have. They always are in contact with joy. So they have a joy, the food of joy. And that food is samadhi, is meditation. Meditation becomes their food. So they don't need the kind of grass food that we have. This is the second kind of eat the nourishment by mental contact. So these second dhyana, their body is in constant meditation posture. Um, of course, they can leave the, the, the posture and get in another posture, but their contact is always joyously contact. So they, when they want to have food, they just sit in meditation and they already have nourishment through meditation. They don't need to eat food. That's the second kind of food, by mental contact, which the first dhyana has. The third kind of food is by volition. That kind of food by volition also happened in this world. When associated, and this kind of food is associated only with the sixth sense, it is characterized by a desire for, for certain perpetual objects. For example, you are involved with, uh, you are on YouTube, you are, you are enjoying a movie, and you enjoy the movie so much that day by day that you're not hungry because you have been fed by the joy of enjoyment, attachment to that movie, that you don't feel hungry at all for the whole day. Because volitionally, you are involved with your, your attachment to that movie. Then you don't need to eat. That's volitional eating, volitional nourishment. And finally, of course, there's, there's a kind of eat, eating that's called consciousness nourishment, which applies to all. You need the alaya consciousness to nourish your body. So, there's a four kind of, of eating, of food. Mouthful food, mental contact food, volitional food, and consciousness food. In this, we need mouthful food to survive. In the first dhyana, they don't need mouthful food. They only need the mental contact food, which is meditation. They're in samadhi all the time. So they don't need, they don't need the tongue to taste the food. They don't need the, the, mouth, the, the, the nose to smell the food. And you think smelling and tasting is good. It's a burden. They don't need that. The kind of nourishment they have is from meditation. They're always in happiness. They don't need a toilet, you know. They don't need to go to the washroom. We do. We do. You know, first thing we do when we want to do certain events, the first thing we consider is to how to create more johns for people to go to. You know what I mean? Ex portable, portable washrooms, and, and when people clean up the portable, portable washrooms, they really stink. I try to clean up those before, one or two before. They really stink. You know, the first, when we consider all this novice ordination, old novice monk ordination, we have to set up washrooms. In there, you don't need any washroom anymore. No more excretion. Meditation. Meditation nourish the body. So, as far as Rams is concerned, all five consciousnesses, the ears, the nose, the body, the, the, the tongue, are active in the first realm. On the second realm, only the eyes, ears, and body consciousness function. The nose consciousness and tongue consciousness do not function because at that level, the smell and taste object of perception do not exist, nor does the type of muscle nourishment which is connected with smell and taste. You think your food tastes good. To them, the kind of food that we are eating is gross. It's, it's terrible. 
They don't need the kind of food we're eating. Their food is samadhi. Their food is meditative concentration. That's their food. Whenever they want any food, they just sit still, and that's the food they have. That nourishes their mind. In the first dhyana, nourishment takes place through contact rather than through the eating of meals, comprised of, uh, uh, of uh, morsels of food. So I have already told you a few topics, most of knowledge, moral nature, perceived world, realms of activities. So your, your, your five, your eyes, your ears, your nose, your body, and all that, five, five, are only active in a low level and in the first dhyana level. When you go up higher and higher, you don't need those consciousness anymore. Those are gross, superficial, low-level consciousness. All right? So when you get higher and higher level into nirvana, you don't need those anymore. Okay, so that's it for now, and we continue next time.